welcome to the Book of Mormon Evidence podcast with host Rod Meldrum. This week's Come Follow Me supplemental study is Lesson 9, 2 Nephi 26-30, through A Marvelous Work and a Wonder. This week's guests are Jewish culture and astronomical science experts, Farrell and Rhonda Pickering. Well, welcome to another edition of our podcast of the Come Follow Me program. This is the supplemental material that we have uh, to go along. Again, we want to just re-emphasize that, uh, that we are expecting that you have already gone through the manual here and gone through that and probably uh, just preparing for your classes. This is additional material that, uh, that hopefully will give you excitement to uh, go, go a, a deep dive, to Absolutely. go even deeper and more into the Book of Mormon this year than you've ever done before. And I, I am excited about uh, who we have here with us today. We've got, we got uh, Rhonda and Farrell Pickering, and, um, and they are experts. We're going to be talking today about, uh, basically, about 2 Nephi and it's some of the Isaiah chapters there, um, 26 to 30. Yes. So uh, we're excited about this. Isaiah, yeah, it was interesting. Uh, in fact, I'm just going to start off with just, just a little quick quote here right from, from uh, 2 Nephi. Uh, where Nephi even, he, he even admits this. He says, uh, this is from 2 Nephi chapter 25, verse 1. Um, and by the way, this is on page 86, if you're using the annotated edition of the Book of Mormon here. He says, Now I, Nephi, do speak somewhat concerning the words which I have written, which have been spoken by the mouth of Isaiah. For behold, Isaiah spake many things which were hard for many of my people to understand. <laughs> okay? For they know not concerning the manner of the prophesying among the Jews. Interesting, because uh, it says that these are hard to understand. And I, and I think probably there's, if you're like me, and uh, I would guess most members of the church, the first couple times you read the Book of Mormon, it's kind of like those are the, the skim through or skip oh, over no. chapters. <laughs> like, and we want, we want to change that. This year, we want, the, we want you to be excited about a deep dive into the Isaiah chapters, which were commanded by the Lord himself, when he's with the Nephites, these things must be not just read, but we need to basically feast on them, right? Yes. Um, and, it, and he also said this, he says, you know, he said, Nephi says that these things were hard for his people, probably hard for our people, but then he also makes this caveat. He says, nevertheless, they are plain unto all those who are filled with the spirit of prophecy. So the only way you're going to really understand uh, this is if you have the spirit of prophecy, but once you have that, apparently, this whole thing's going to become just like a like an open book, so to speak. And it's going to be clear and plain and precious. And if you feel like you don't have the spirit of prophecy, Revelation 19 says that the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. So if you've got a testimony of Jesus Christ, you can do this. So really, <laughs> so really it's That's the awesome. deeper your testimony of Christ, the more you understand. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's beautiful. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Okay, so um, then the uh, the other the other thing is kind of just a little bit of an opener here. Um, we're going to be talking uh, uh, quite a bit actually, and uh, pulling information from the annotated Book of Mormon. Excellent. And one of the things that Rhonda brought up, which is before we started this, was that um, so in, throughout the the uh, the annotated Book of Mormon and the Isaiah chapters, there are these underlined parts. Absolutely yes. And I've had so many people say, "Well, gosh, well, you know, what is the underline just for emphasis, just to kind of show something important there?" The answer to that's no. Actually, the reason why there's underlining in the uh, in, in some of these Isaiah say, chapters, yeah. basically, is when the Book of Mormon version of Isaiah, which is being quoted, is different from the King James version of Isaiah, which uh, which actually um, you know. Came much easier. It's, it's interesting because if you take a look at the at the actual Greek, which is what the King James version was originally translated from, and you do a modern day translation, actually you end up with something more along the lines of what Joseph Smith had. In other words, yes. this is the inspired <laughs> version. Yes. So, but if you want to tell where there's a difference in the phrase or in a word or whatever, when it's underlined, that means that that word is different. If you go to the King James version and then you look at the annotated edition. The uh, of the Book of Mormon, the Book of Mormon edition basically is um, that's where it's different from the King James. And can I tell you another thing that I really yes. love about the annotated version, yeah. and that's that because when we're quoting Isaiah, it's in that blue italicized text. That's right. Okay? That's right. But when we're not quoting Isaiah, it's when commentary. we're just having Nephi explain Isaiah, 
It's in the regular it. black text. And so you can actually tell the difference <laughs> between what, I mean, because, you know, you I, I can tell now when he's quoting Isaiah, but, you know, when I very first started, you know, you don't It's really hard to know. tell. It's all black. It's all <laughs> just it's black all like text. it's all in black and white in yeah. the annotated version. Black when, and blue. Yeah, black yeah. and blue. When <laughs> Nephi is quoting or when he yeah. um, when, when he's commenting. And, and you can tell the difference, and it's it's wonderful. It, it makes it makes a big. Oh, I've had so references. many people say, "Oh my goodness, I, I I didn't realize, you know." And especially when it has the red, because this is the Lord speaking here, this is Isaiah speaking here, and then this is Nephi's commentary in the middle of it. Uh, it's just it's just fantastic. Now we're we're, we're wrapping up the, uh, the the portions of Nephi's um, that here in in Second Nephi here, chapter twenty six is where we're going to be starting here. <clears throat> And so again, just for context, you need to understand that this is this is not part of what was in the original set of plates. This is actually the small plates of Nephi that was added, um, that was added after to the after the 116 were pages lost. were lost. This is what was this is what was replacing essentially the planned it that way. Yeah, yeah, it was exactly like got a plan, but it was uh, not the not the original understanding as far as what Joseph Smith and and uh, Oliver Cowdery and so forth understood. But so coming back to this, so. Um, so that's that makes it interesting. We only have three more chapters, basically, that Nephi wrote, right. and uh, so what what are the things that he wants for us? Now, again, understanding that he has, um, you know, written this for not for his people. His people never saw his stuff. Us, yeah. It was for us. And as we go through this, we can we can look at the Isaiah chapters and see, okay, how does this apply to our time? What is, what is it that he's trying to tell us? And I think it's also just a fascinating thing. We already talked about this just briefly um, in previous podcasts about the, the fact that you have Nephi has, has shown all of this material. And then he, and he tells us up to when he says, but now the Spirit has constrained me and I can't tell you anymore. <laughs> That's the best part. <laughs> so, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I can't say it, but there's this other guy who already has permission right. from the Lord. His name is Isaiah. So I'm going to put his stuff in there to take the place of what I was wanting to tell you. Right. And so that's what's so cool is because he uses that. So now we know basically what Nephi was trying to tell us, but he's doing it through Isaiah. Exactly. So an understanding of this is how important is, is an understanding of Isaiah? <laughs> what do you say, Rhonda? I would say <laughs> that it's probably critical to understand what Nephi's talking about yeah. and, um, and to understand the tools that, that, the tools that will unlock Isaiah will also unlock yeah. the entire Book of Mormon. And so there, there's a whole level of understanding in the Book of Mormon that you can't have without understanding Isaiah. That's why Jesus commanded us. Okay, you, you guys have got to tell us a little bit about yourself. So uh, go ahead, Farrell, you are going to say something there. Well, I was just going to add to the whole Isaiah thing, but when he did tell the story, Isaiah, that we're talking, he yeah. put a little bit in code so that it wouldn't be just obviously plain to the words, casual you, passer. You had to do a little you bit of work, a little this, digging yeah, you have to, have to get this. Of yeah. prophecy like we talked about before. You asked me to give a little introduction. My yeah. name is obviously Farrell Pickering. I worked most of my life, believe it or not, in a contracting. But in the last several years, I've had just such a, I say several, 15. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, 15 years, I've gotten such a passion with with my wife, who taught seminary all of her life in private school settings and different times. And so she has been totally embraced but i've enjoyed as my my other life quieted a little uh -huh. to just join her in the ranks and it's just been wonderful um i've enjoyed it so much i don't know if there's anything you well, want to add i was just going to say he's yes. he's kind of our expert on the stars um yes. I, this is amazing funny. stuff this is funny. Yes. Say, for his about 10 years ago for his birthday i bought him starry night pro <laughs> Because, because and you haven't seen him since. For me, it was you know like oh no, one more computer program I have to. Learn. And plus, you know his the way his mind works. He he can spin the planets in his mind. He knows where the moon's gonna rise every night. You know he yeah, yeah. just 
has this three dimensional brain. So, so I Very spatial in the way I, I do all the yeah, yeah. book work and everything, but he's 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 the brilliance behind a lot of the stuff we do. So wow. anyway, I just want to. I I talk a lot, so <laughs> you might not know that, but but really, he he is just a truth brilliant. of it is is you talk so well it's hard to <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so. and, and and plus you're you're, you're you know I, I hope you can just kind of you know keep your energy levels up because no, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I am known in my classroom yeah. as so so the who, fire hydrant yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the kids come for a drink of water and <laughs> 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 so, anyway that, you bet, I love you Isaiah bet. I love Isaiah okay so. so I know you've had some uh, some mentors over the course of time oh, absolutely. um Tell us a little bit about who some of your mentors are, or kind of how you really decided to just jump into this. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna just jump right into what we were talking about before. We were talking about Nephi and how the angel said <laughs> stop, and so that's your clue that something great's coming, and it's usually straight out of Isaiah. So, um, in, and then Nephi goes and he tells this journey experience. We have okay. What, what is this you got in your hand here? What, what oh this? yeah, this is a this is my great marvelous sandwich. Okay, <laughs> so. This is this is this is the great and marvelous sandwich, this folks. Is the okay, great marvelous sandwich. right there. <clears throat> so in First <laughs> Nephi thirteen and fourteen, you know we had Nephi talking about Columbus and the Revolutionary War and all this awesome stuff, and then he starts to kind of talk about the Gentiles. Uh -huh. yeah, we're we're going to have to talk about. Farrell's going to tell us a little bit more about, about the, the time of the Gentiles and, just and who they are. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Because if you don't get that, you miss it from chapter thirteen in uh -huh. First Nephi. Yeah through the rest of the Book of Orion. So we're gonna have to cover that. But anyway, so what he does is when the angel tells him he can't tell us more, he starts to build what I call a sandwich. Everything that's between the two buns, which were the title of the sandwich, that's why this one's the great and marvelous sandwich, are a coded type of what he couldn't tell us. So everything that Nephi tells us about the journey in the wilderness, the, the ball, the bow, the boat, and all the experiences they have, yeah. how, how Laman and Lemuel refuse to inquire, and the Book of Mormon says, that's hardening your heart. See, this is all talking about us. Yeah. This is talking about us in the last day. What's going to happen when all these things that Nephi's talking about in the restoration of the house of Israel, when they come down and the big division that happens and everything, there's going to be some of us that we don't usually, you know, we, we think we're Nephi and Sam, right? <laughs> <laughs> None of us read it and think, None oh gosh, murmur. I'm like Layman and Lemuel. <laughs> None of us ever murmur. <laughs> but that's why Nephi put it in there. Because, you know, five of us are... Five virgins are wise and five virgins are foolish, and yeah. we do do some of these things. So this is all about us. That journey in the wilderness, they could have said a hundred things about their experiences, you know, the sea monsters, all that stuff. No, but they talked about these things because it's about us. And then right after he talks about the wilderness journey, which yeah. we'll replay in the end time, we will have a wilderness journey, then he throws in Isaiah 48 and 49. And you got to make it, and all the way through Isaiah, you got to make it through the gloomy stuff. That's because it always comes first. That's yeah, actually right. a Hebrew structure to do the descent before the ascent. So we okay. always have a happy ending. So that means the gloomy stuff. So if you get stuck on the gloomy stuff and then say, oh, I think I'll just skip the Isaiah chapter. <laughs> no, you missed all the good stuff. Okay, so. <laughs> anyway, Isaiah 49, the one that he throws in there right before he says and and that's the great marvelous stuff that i couldn't tell you about which was the other <laughs> button okay um he talks about the kings and the queens of the gentiles yeah and how in the end time in the restoration of the house of israel that lehi and nephi and all of the prophets are talking about in the book of mormon that that there has to be kings and queens of the gentiles that when all of the destruction stuff that it was talking about in chapter happens, 48 yeah. happens they come to the rescue and so this has everything to do with the restoration of the prophet joseph smith in the time of the gentiles and 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 oh my gosh i love isaiah and i do crazy stuff you know yeah, I, just, I, I teach her. the kids. And, and, and you also teach, you teach kids now, right? I mean, right. You, you, you tell Absolutely. us a little bit about what you're doing with that. Oh, we're teaching. 
We're teaching. Can I tell on you? Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> At her last class when I was there and I was helping her, I says, you know, the difference between, well, first off, I went, I think it's Despicable Me. I don't know my... Yeah, my Despicable You. Any men, As the, anyway, the Minions. Uh, the Minions, yeah. but anyway, yeah. I think that's the right movie. It might be the other one. I can't remember. <laughs> but anyway, in that movie, he says, you know what the difference between a villain and a supervillain is? Presentation. Well, the difference between... <laughs> the difference between a teacher and a super teacher... Is presentation. presentation. <laughs> and, and, and I, yeah. But I need, to, I need to say, though, that this is super important before we turn it over to the time of the Gentiles, is that all of my work, I, I love the work of Abraham Gilead. He, he uh -huh. unsealed Isaiah for me, and me I, he has me been my friend and my mentor for all all of the 25 years that I've been writing the book Isaiah Illustrated. Mm -hmm. So I am so grateful that he lets me use his material. I'm so grateful that he lets me turn his stuff into crazy object lessons <laughs> for the kids. But, you know, his mission was to un unseal Isaiah, and yeah. my mission is to unseal it for the teenagers. I, w I, wonder, I wonder if this is what, what he had in mind here, and, and, and like we just read in, in, in 2 Nephi chapter 25 and verse 1, it says, you know, about the, he spake many things which were hard for my people. He says, because they do not know the manner of prophesying among the Jews. I mean, it, it would take somebody who has a deep understanding like of Abraham. Jewish culture yes. and Jewish, yes. you know, these, these, this prophesying among the Jews, somebody who was raised up in that culture to really fully comprehend and understand what, uh, what he was, what Nephi is basically saying here was the reason why their people didn't understand and why we can. And the same tools that the Jews yeah. use to make like these sandwiches, you're going to find them all over the book. You're, you're going to get so excited when you start to see chiasms in the Doctrine and Covenants. I mean, <laughs> the fingerprint of God is all over the scriptures. And once yeah. you get the tools that you learn with Isaiah, it unlocks all the scriptures. So, so, this, so, so, this, so this is the great and marvelous yeah, sandwich. What yeah. is this one? This is the great and marvelous sandwich. Oh, wait, well, this, this one. This is we... the less great <laughs> and less marvelous no, sandwich? No, no, no. This one is <laughs> the more great and more sorry. This one's Jesus' sandwich. Because, oh, this is Jesus because sandwich. these okay. sandwiches, this is actually just a literary structure. It's like yeah. writing an essay. You say what you're going to say, then you tell why you said what you're going to say, then you say what you're going to say again. You know, right, it's right, like right. an essay. Yeah. But it, we call these the brackets, the titles of the, of the bracketing. And so in this, this one, in this sandwich, the title is Search Isaiah. Okay. And this is in, from 3rd Nephi. So this is Jesus commanding us. And this one is, I command you yeah. to study Isaiah. Well, when Jesus does that, then what you got to do is you got to look in the middle of the, the brackets, in the middle Between of the those, sandwiches yeah. to find out why you're supposed to study Isaiah. And so in between those two commandments, you have a letter to the house of Israel. And we're going to be back to, and we're going to have to define who the house of Israel is. Yeah. And yeah. then we have a letter to the Gentiles. And they're all in these magnificent chiasms that, that we'll show you on the screen. And then he throws in one whole chapter of Isaiah. Mm -hmm. And in this chapter of Isaiah, he talks about his first bride, Israel. How in the end time, you have the restoration of Israel. She comes back to him. Okay, and then you have his bride, the Gentiles. Yeah. Well, kind of in, in the end game. The Gentiles split 50-50, and, and some stay true, and some don't when all this tribulation and all this persecution starts to happen. Yeah. And so that's what Nephi's doing. He's pleading. Oh, 2 Nephi 28 in our reading block? Like seven woes to the Gentiles. <laughs> and, and we read them. We read them like, oh, those were about the, the sectarians in Joseph Smith's day, or though that, no, yeah. it, it's about us in the future in the, in when this stuff comes and it happens. And, wow. and we'll talk about that in a minute, but I want him to, and, and, and Jesus commands us to do it because it will help us understand all prophecy. It's critical. And when, when we start to understand this, um, we had this discussion uh, in a previous uh, podcast, or I, I actually, I guess it's in an upcoming podcast. <laughs> you get yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's hard to get that straight. But, but, uh, but basically, there, there's, God has got so much more for us to know. But we can't know it until we at least know these things. 
Yes. As a people, we need to know these things. So I think that what we're trying to do here, if we can get, if we could get majority of the church membership to basically to really understand Isaiah and really and really do that, maybe we would start to qualify then for God to begin the release of additional information. But He can't release it until we are ready, and Absolutely. we're apparently not ready because He's not releasing it as right. far as we know. Well, it says that as soon as the Gentiles, which He's about to talk about, are are you know. According to Columbus <laughs> and the <laughs> Revolutionary <laughs> War, there, that's us and everything. And, and according to DNC 109, verse 60, Joseph Smith says, We are numbered with the Gentiles. It's, right. it's Americans yeah. in the Book of Mormon, um, which just means among the nations. Gentiles is just nations. Yeah. Um, we have to understand who we are before yeah. we'll understand our role as the kings and queens of the Gentiles yeah. in the end time. In, in the same way that in, in uh, section 3 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord uh, said that the, 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 the Lamanites are not going to blossom, basically, or they, you know, they're not going to really um, come to an understanding of who they, of, of their role in God's eternal plan until they know who they are, right. that they are the remnant of the house of Israel, that they are the covenant people of God. And which is so, which so, is so critical that this house uh, becomes known to them. So in, house of Israel and Gentiles, help us out. Well, so in general, you know, you're talking about the Gentiles. You have to kind of go back to the root of where we kind of get in, introduced to the idea. Mm -hmm. And we get introduced to the idea for the first time kind of at the woman at the well. Okay, we get introduced to the idea that the, the Gentiles is who Christ first reveals himself to because his people aren't ready to receive him. I mean, we have Peter who kind of received him. Mm -hmm. I kind of, absolutely received him. <laughs> uh, okay, absolutely received him, but he, yeah. he didn't receive him because Christ testified to him who he was. It was a spiritual witness of who he was because yeah. Christ asked him. Well, at the woman of the well, we have this example of him actually testifying who he is to a Gentile. Why is she a Gentile? Because she is half Israel uh -huh. and half Outside of Out Israel. Of Israel. Yeah. Right. Because when the Assyrians came in, they they would mix cultures. Yeah. So in essence, she's half Ephraim mm -hmm. and half Gentile or half nations. So that is that is Gentile, is mixed amongst the nations. Mm -hmm. Ephraim mixed amongst the nations. The Israel mixed amongst the nations. Mm -hmm. So when you think about this idea of Gentiles and you think about who we are, you know, at the dedication of the Kirtland Temple, we know that he referred to us as being identified with the with Gentiles. The Gentiles. Yeah. So Which, by the way, that was what that was one of the the uh, the only well maybe not the only but it was it was the first temple dedication number one, but secondly, Joseph Smith said that he received that by revelation from God. So right. yes, everything so, in that section on the on the temple dedication basically is all directly from the Lord according to Joseph. Right. So in that concept. Going back to this woman at the well, we get a little example that he spends two days with this woman oh, yeah. and with the Samaritans. Okay, if you go to the Feast of the Lord or the Festival of the Lord and you go to the, the first fruits offering, which is when Christ was actually resurrected. That's my expertise is kind of the numbers and how the numbers all stack <laughs> in. Anyway, that at, that, at that first fruits resurrection where Christ was actually resurrected on the first day of the week, representing actually the eighth day is the first day if you think about the, the uh, whole week, comparison right. and a week anyway but as he is resurrected on that day that is the day when all of israel would celebrate with two large loaves of bread mm -hmm. representing the two days of the gentiles and in hosea 6 he goes through and he he tells us, and I can't read from here. You could read well, it if you read want. It you? Read it real fast. Okay. So Hosea 6 says, Come and let us return to the Lord. Now remember that Hosea is the prophet to Ephraim. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he hath torn us, but he will heal us. He hath smitten, but he will bind us up. Okay. That's, you know, Isaiah 48 in that great marvelous sandwich. Mm -hmm. After two days, he will revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up. That's kind of cryptic. Yeah, that that's, it, it seems a little strange, but when you realize, because, you, you, uh, well, I, I wanted to just present this while I'm here. In this woman yeah. at the well, I go through this in very detail. 
Every detail of the Every house detail of the woman of the well is a prophetic picture, and it, it ties into the book of Revelation. It ties into so many things. And that's kind of a beginning to understand this relationship of the Gentiles in this. What's, what's the name of that again? This is the woman at the well. <laughs> okay, but yeah, but it's, it's hidden, hidden prophetic codes, Revelation of John four, the woman at the well. Okay. Right. Right. Anyway, in that in that video, we we ex expound the whole relationship between the woman of the well and the nations of the earth, and the relationship of the whole thing and how prophetic it is, tying in the book of Revelation. Anyway, so when you understand that. The two days of the Gentiles represented by this offering. See, that's what the festivals are all about, mm -hmm. is their prophetic rehearsals of what's going to happen. Right. Christ fulfilled so completely the prophetic rehearsal at Passover. And so these, these pictures that we have are prophetic pictures, and that's what they're, that's what they're meant to be. So this, this celebration of the two days, it's just beautiful because you realize, you know, just do the math real quick. Christ was crucified in 33, a day being a thousand years to the Lord. You know, two days is almost up. <laughs> you know, we're pretty close. We're getting pretty close. And if you if you go to another, the, another lifetime, if you go to the yeah. trump, About another 13 more years. If you go to the trumpet yeah. that was sounded when the Book of Mormon came out of Camorra on Feast of Trumpets. Yes. Two days from there is 27. Wait, so. Wait. So we are, we're, we're on the threshold of masterfully, wonderfully things coming about on this planet. I mean, this, this segregation of, of opinion and how it's polarizing. You see it in the world everywhere. People are taking sides. Yes. Very so polarizing. Do the math. Do the math for me. What, how many years since Joseph Smith restored the gospel? Yeah, you're... you're are you, am I jumping? You, well, you're not jumping, <laughs> but you're, you're, oh, you're grounding me. <laughs> you're grounding me back. But anyway... Oh, so, by, by the way, just before, before you get off of that subject, just hang on to that thought for just a second. In the Annotated Book of Mormon, yes, it actually talks a little bit yes. about the Feast of Trumpets and being the September 22nd, 1827. Right. Uh, was and when this was actually and, would, and would have fallen on that he time. He went there like four yeah. years, and Moroni said, "Not now." And then yeah, he year, waited. Not now for this year. prophetic okay, fulfillment. Okay, now this day, this, this time, this year. Yeah. The so, Book of Mormon goes out. Yes. So it's it's so important. Right, 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 on the yeah. face, <laughs> right on the face of Trump. By the way, that's yeah. that's is on page. Um, <laughs> page, yeah. Um, let's see, that's uh, nineteen. X X I X. <laughs> yes, that is 19. <laughs> in Hebrew. In, 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 in Hebrew. <laughs> in, so in Roman when, numerals. You, when you take this picture of two days in consideration of 2,000 years, what's a tithe of two days? What's 10%? 200 years. 200 years. Out of so 2,000. So Out the of book 2, of Mormon. 2,000 years, a tithe would be 10% of that. Right? Yeah, 10%. Yeah. So 200 years. The Book of Mormon came out 200 years in 27. Mm -hmm. I mean, this... This tide, this this picture we're looking at is holy incredible. Portion. This holy portion that came of with the, the restoration, all of it is about to come forth. I mean, we're we're on the doorstep yeah. of the time of the Gentiles being fulfilled. And this two hundred years is the fullness of the Gentiles. That's yeah. what Joseph Smith brought yeah. in. That's the, that's the two days you're talking about here in Hosea. In Hosea, right. it's the two represented days of the Gentiles. by so the Gentiles. very festivals that. That the Jews keep, and, and they don't know what they're doing. Just like they didn't know what the Passover. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't get it, and they missed it. <laughs> and so, when officially did the gospel go to the nations or to the Gentiles? So, if you if you look at official, obviously it's a, it's Pentecost, Pentecost is a, right? an absolute official. Acts chapter, but it was a preliminary go to the Gentiles with the woman. When he at the introduced well. it to the woman at the well. In approximately thirty thirty one, A. D. So we have. This transition during Christ's life of, you know, approximately Those three and a half years, years of, of ministry. Rejection. Three and a half years, isn't it? Yeah, we have this parallels that are going on everywhere. If you start to see the parallels, you start to take note. You know yeah. what I mean? Because okay. he does say in Hosea, after two days, he will restore them. So right, right then you had a rejection where the Jews rejected Christ. And so the gospel went to the nations. And so Brigham Young like the Romans says and so forth, that right? at the second coming of Christ, we will do the same thing the Jews did. Third Nephi 16, when the Gentiles, not if, when the Gentiles as a nation mm -hmm. reject 
the gospel when this at this big time of division that Nephi's talking about, then the gospel will go back to the house of Israel, mm-hmm. which is. I'm not sure where you're going. Which, the house drifted. of Israel, it's not the Jews, right? It's not just the Jews. Oh, no, it's a greater house of Israel. Right. And right. It's yeah, not, we're talking right. the three branches, which is another That's a whole other thing. <laughs> yeah, it's a whole other, that's another DVD. The three branches. <laughs> <laughs> right. you better explain that one. <laughs> yeah, so the three branches of the house of Israel all throughout Scripture are the Jews, and okay. that branch got taken captive into Babylon, and then you have the ten tribes. They were taken mm-hmm. captive into all nations when mm-hmm. Assyria conquered them, mm-hmm. and then the third branch that gets broken off. And Lehi keep and Nephi they keep talking about this. We're a branch that mm-hmm. got broken off. Mm-hmm. They're the the branch that got taken to America, the Lamanites. Yeah. So in the end time, whenever it talks about the gospel going back to the house of Israel, it's talking about those ethnic. Lineages, all the of them. Lamanites, all of them the from Jews, Jacob. spoken of in Ezekiel, yes, even when you read it closely. It's not just the two branches; it's the three. Right. Mm-hmm. So Ezekiel's got three branches. Um, in Jacob five, there's three branches that get broken off. One that's called the last branch is just referring back to the last branch. It's the same branch. Um, mm-hmm. There's three branches all through Scripture, even in. Even in Second Nephi, where we've been reading, it says that okay. in the end time, when there's that restoration, it Ooh. says that the um, the Jews' records will go to that the, 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 we'll all have each other's records. The ten tribes have their own records. The Jews mm-hmm. have their own records, and and the Lamanites have their own records, and they all become one, one word of God in this Do you grand want to explain restoration. The what the Lulav? Oh, yes, yes, okay. <laughs> that goes right in. <laughs> in, in. In the festivals or these prophetic appointments that God established in Leviticus 23 that are all attached to the stars and the moon, and it's like... But, a by the way, the, 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 this, this is the whole Hebrew calendar system yes. that was given to the Hebrews basically by God. And Nephi So this is God's Levi calendar system that, that he wanted them system. to use. Right, okay. Right, and, yeah. and so you've got the Newark Earthworks, and it's all a lunar-based calendar because they kept these appointed times and these festivals mm-hmm. oh gosh this is just a tangent but when in third nephi when when jesus comes and he tells them that he's fulfilled the law and he gives them all of the, the like the new sermon on the mouth the sermon at the temple and they are worried about how not to think bad thoughts when when jesus gets <laughs> to the end of it he says i i did i you're you're concerned about something what is it they're like what do we do without the law of Moses? You know, we've been doing this for 600 years. How do we not have our That's just on this times? continent. Yeah. And so... And well, so, no, it gets... Yes. Uh, 600 years on this continent. This yes. is yeah. huge in the Book of Mormon. The ability to keep these festivals and when you realize that they were the only ones on the earth who understood them, that understood that they were types yeah. of Christ. Because, because a- after the Babylonian captivity and after the Assyrian... You know, uh, they kept they, them, they, but they, they didn't get yeah, them. And so forth. Yeah, they they. Were it's all, it became first. ritual. Yeah, right. it became right. meaningless. But they lost the, the 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 more plain and precious parts of it. Yeah. So yeah. when when the house of Israel as a whole rejected Christ, all of these festivals, all of the laws of Moses and everything, they got put on suspension. You know, no more during the time of the mm-hmm. Gentiles. And you know, one more thing about the Gentiles that I think is critical for us to understand when we read the Book of Mormon is that we look back in history and we see that the gospel goes to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, and we're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. But to the Jews, that was totally out of their paradigm. If you look in the Old Testament, they were under a covenant at Mount Sinai that as a whole nation, they would keep God's commandments. Mm -hmm. And then if they made a treaty with another nation and brought that nation in, that was... That was a bad thing because then they brought in people who didn't know how to keep the commandments and the whole nation would come under condemnation. So in the Old Testament, you did not go bring the gospel to the nations because it would condemn you and it would condemn them because Jesus Christ hadn't atoned yet. As soon as Jesus Christ fulfilled the atonement, then we were covered. The nations could be covered. The covenant could go to them, and they wouldn't wow. be condemned 
for breaking it out of the gate because Jesus covered it. And so they, they when Jesus sat down with sinners and everything, that was just horrific to the Pharisees and the Sadducees because you are yeah. you're bringing our nation <laughs> under condemnation here. Yeah. That's how they thought about it. And yet, what what I'm saying, and, and yet at the same time, as you think about them, they kept these observances very close. Yeah, they did to the correct way, and therefore, For a, long, a long lot of the of symbolic meanings remain, even though they miss it. Yeah, like what we started to talk about is the lulav. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> and the lulav in that situation <laughs> is the, explain that. What you tell that? him. You'll do better on right, the explanation. So, but that, during the Feast of Tabernacles, which is one of the fall appointments, the fall right, the, the three right. fall feasts represent the second coming of Christ. They they every day for during the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days, they grab three branches in their hand. Okay? Mm-hmm. One Buy is them. a palm, one is a willow, and one is a myrtle branch. And you know what? You can if you do your homework in the scriptures, you can match those up to which which one it was. Lamanites, ten tribes, and Jews. You can match it up, and they they march around the altar and they wave the lulav to the north, to the south, to the east, to the, the west, of the four and up of the and earth. down, corners, yeah. and up and down too. So it's not just the four corners of the earth. That's it's everything. heaven and That's the spirit good. world. Yeah. This is a gathering of Israel in the end time Wide scale. that Nephi is talking about in these temp- in these chapters and in Isaiah chapter eleven yeah. when they're gathered from everywhere. Just a little, just a little. This is a completely off the wall side side note here for just a second. Yeah. But if you if you've ever seen Native American ceremonies around the medicine wheel, yes. Uh, what do they do? I mean, they have the things they're going. There's a I semblance go, of go these to the north, to the these, south, to the east, to the west. This is a total Native American thing, which is also just happens to be because of their of Hebrew Lehi? roots. <laughs> Hebrew roots. <laughs> Hebrew ancestry. Yes, their yeah. Hebrew roots is coming through. We actually yeah. went with Little Bear to one of those ceremonies yeah. back in Oklahoma. Yes, yeah. and, and they still build. The they tabernacle. still do build tabernacles. They do a ton of things, which so awesome. which is really. But they haven't got fascinating. a clue. Though. Yeah, yeah they, why well. they do it? I mean, <laughs> yeah. Because this is what we do. Exactly. <laughs> anyway, exactly. so there's these these observances have come come through, but they've lost a lot of the meaning. Now, Little yeah. Barrett argued they haven't completely lost it for sure. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, he would yeah, definitely take. No, yes, absolutely. He would definitely no take the position yeah. that there's a lot of those. But that's why there things has to be remain. a restoration. That's the whole thing. A gathering. Is talking about when they bind this lulav, they bind it together. These three branches. They have to become one branch. They have to become one branch. And tell yeah. about the like fruit. in Ezekiel. And yeah. and they have to just bind it tight so that it's one branch. And what yeah. about the fruit? Take it. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just think. If you picked your favorite fruit, uh-huh. okay, everybody needs to think, okay, for a minute. What's okay. your favorite fruit? Okay. Because okay. we have to pick a perfect fruit to yeah. represent good fruit. So what you got? Peach. A peach. I like peaches. <laughs> okay. We're all going to pick. I haven't gotten grapes. Was, was it, oh, your uh, grapes, grapes are okay. Your grapes, you know, okay. Some grapes, sort of okay. Like, all right. All I'm right. a little closer. I like What'd grapefruit. You, <laughs> grapefruit. <laughs> you like grapefruit. That's I'm gonna, downright the, the, controversial. The, the, the sour. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the juice picked, it's like a lemon with a skin a half inch thick. And it's called an atrug. And it's kind of lumpy, like a lumpy lemon. And you're thinking, Mm. What in the world? Why, Why did you that? pick this to represent good fruit? And this is the reason because if you put it on the table and you leave it for a month, it's still good. It's not going to rot. It's because still going to be good. It's got it such a dry thick. up before it will rot. And in Isaiah chapter five, which is quoted in Second Nephi fifteen, it says so it's that there's, that there's wild good fruit is fruit that will not right rot. rot before it's ripe. And in Isaiah, the fruit is rotting before it has a chance to ripen, and that is a condition of apostasy. And so, mm-hmm. and that's what's in Jacob five as well when it talks about all the vineyard the has of the olive tree. wild yeah. olive tree. Okay, and so here again, we're getting right back to Second Nephi. 28 where he's giving like seven woes to the gentiles saying right at this time when there's going to be a great conversion of the house of israel to jesus christ the gentiles are in a place of apostasy and due for judgment 
Mm-hmm. And so that's that's why he says, don't trust in the arm of flesh. Like he says it three times. Yeah. And I think that that's just, wasn't that in Lehi's dream. Is that dream? fake news? <laughs> what, wasn't, yeah, that, probably. wasn't that in Lehi's dream? Which what the, the uh, about when, the, but, when he yeah. was trusting in the arm of flesh, the man. Oh yeah, there's the, the, the man with the white robe and so forth. And he starts to follow him and he leads him in and, and he gets totally lost. And, hours and hours <laughs> in the dark and dreary wilderness. Yeah. And it wasn't until he basically stopped following that guy, and had his own personal saw the tree. relationship relationship with the tree, and then he went for the tree, right. and that's when he got there. But when he was following the other guy around, it was taking him into these dark paths. Yeah. And you know, one of the coolest things about the tree is that Nephi is told that it represents the love of God. And then it's fascinating what you see. This is the love of God. And then here's a picture. Jesus Christ being born. Here's a picture. Mm-hmm. Jesus Christ. This is the love of God. This is ministry to descending to help others. This is giving your life for others. This is love. Yeah. And so in Hebrew, back to Isaiah and our Jewish tools of learning here, there's something called the law of first mention. And so what that means is like, in Joel, he's the first prophet to mention the day of the Lord. And so his description becomes a prototype that all the other prophets will build well, off yeah. of because he was the first one to mention it. So here's the question. Where in the scriptures is the first mention of love? I know, I know. Be- <laughs> do, you, do you know? Do you know? Tell me, tell me. Abraham and Isaac. When a father gives his son. Oh wow! It's the first mention of love so in the scriptures. He prototyped his love in Abraham and Isaac. Yeah. So that's, that, that's uh, just uh, when you learn the tools. Well, and he, has, and he even tells us a little bit more about it later. No greater love hath any man than he giveth his life John for another. You know, God so, so basically, loved yeah, the world yeah. That he gave his only begotten mm-hmm. son. That's but your definition in it's, love. Exactly. Love is when you when you care more about the needs and wants of another person than and your you're own. And you're willing to sacrifice yeah. for them, and that is the mission of the kings and the queens of the Gentiles. Mm-hmm. It isn't just to hand them a book we of Mormon. We have to get there and become we have saviors to, on Mount Zion. We have to be like Ammon and Aaron and Omner and Himni. We have to be willing to serve mm-hmm. and love mm-hmm. and bring them to the light that we were given. Yeah. So that Which was just also another interesting thing about Lehi's you know, vision of the tree of life, basically, is after he partook of the fruit, what's the first thing he wanted to do? Share. Where's my family? Yeah, absolutely. And, that and then not only just where's my family, where's everybody else? And then that's when he started looking around, oh, there's the great and spacious building. <laughs> he Uh-oh. sees all the other people getting lost and, yes. and people hanging out of the rod. And <laughs> that's the same thing in Isaiah. That ladder over there represents different... Oh, yeah, let's, let's different bring that out over here. So, what, okay. so tell so, us about yeah, this, I, Rhonda. I told you, I'm like crazy prop lady. But anyway, <laughs> so this is a ladder. We, we actually have a great big one that's like nine feet tall. And it's got all the <laughs> definitions in Isaiah of what the people in so a lot of people call this like the Jacob's Ladder, right? Yes. But, but you call it something else when yes. you first this showed is, it to me today. This is Isaiah's Ladder the to Heaven. Isaiah's Ladder to Heaven. Okay, okay. so in Isaiah, whenever <clears throat> he speaks of Babylon, he, he starts to mention certain characteristics. And whenever he mentions Zion or Jerusalem, there's they're repentant, certain characteristics about them. Jacob and Israel, they're trying to make up their mind. They can't decide between Babylon and Zion. And, and, <laughs> and Isaiah is so perfectly consistent about the way he describes each group that he creates these levels like kingdoms of heaven, like telestial, terrestrial, and celestial uh-huh. kingdoms, all the way up to God at the top, which is what Jacob saw in Genesis, and perdition at the bottom, Mm -hmm. those who refuse. And so all throughout the book, there's all these different levels. And in Isaiah, just like at the tree of life, love is to descend and help someone, Mm. to be willing to reach out to them, to look for others, because the only way to ascend in the kingdom of God is to be willing to help others. To, to give, yeah. Yeah. 
and and that's all pictured in the so a couple of things you can't you can't quite see that some of the little angels here yeah that's kind all of the a, angels going up and down that's the sun servant the uh, seraph the so it starts off with perdition the bottom then right. we have the babylon mm -hmm. jacob and israel yep <coughs> third yep. rung fourth zion rung and is jerusalem. Zion that, jerusalem that's god's people they've mm -hmm. been baptized they're under covenant okay okay and you have sons and sons and servants those servants. are our prophets okay. Those are our leaders of, of okay. Zion, and they have mighty ones, angels like like archangels, like okay. Michael, dispensation like, leaders. Yeah, like Dispen like Lady Gabriel. Okay. These are these are messengers from God that are bringing mm -hmm. the the information to, and okay. then we and have then of have course have... God at the top, and that that's seven seven different levels of people that Isaiah describes just in his text alone, mm -hmm. and. Nephi is is seeing different levels of people in this end time prophecy. He he's talking about a division right here where Jacob Israel are 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 the is Zion going to choose to fulfill her mission and to to go out as 144,000 and rescue the house of Israel or are they going to um mm -hmm. opt out? And if they are, they get left out in the darkness of Babylon with the king of Assyria and, and, and yeah. the destruction. And all those chapters that Nephi put in the Book of Mormon, chapters 2 through chapters 14, 14 is when the king of Assyria or Babylon gets destroyed. But all those other chapters, like, oh, this is, this is so cool, because like in chapter 19, you've got... This is, you're talking about... I'm talking Book of Mormon, 2nd right. Nephi, Second, okay. 19, yeah. quoting Isaiah chapter 9. Right, okay? right. So, so you have a servant, uh, 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 someone of the, the lineage of Jesse, a uh, David, and then in chapter 11, it talks about him again and how he's going to gather all of Israel, and then right there in the middle, between 9 and 11, You've got this awful chapter of this king of Assyria that's, you know, chopping down the trees of the forest and robbing <laughs> the world of it. And, Plundering. And uh -huh. It's yeah. so cool the way Isaiah structured mm, it. Because you have the defeat because he's in the middle between the two chapters of the servant. And that, and that one chapter, chapter 11, that's talking about the defeat and the gathering of Israel and, and then the servant in the last days... That's Second Nephi chapter thirty, and that's how mm -hmm. he's going to end this section. He's going to quote those chapters and, mm -hmm. and and give a commentary on Isaiah chapter eleven. So. All right, well that's that is fantastic. So let's let's go ahead and um, cool. let's, let's just jump in then to uh, a little going? bit more in Second Nephi just uh, chapter twenty six. Okay. Uh, Nephi's prophecies continue. Okay, he's been talking about uh, you know, believing in Christ and the law of Moses and so forth. Um, and you pointed out something that was kind of interesting to me here in the, uh, in, this is page 88 in the Annotated Book of Mormon. Um, and verse, that the second Nephi chapter 26, verse 4, says, Wherefore, all those who are proud and that do wickedly, the day that cometh shall burn them. Okay? But where does that come from? Okay, so this is the, basically the Lord, but this is coming from Malachi. Right. And you mentioned something about that interesting because um, how did Nephi? He said Malachi and Zechariah. How, how was he quoting Malachi? Right. When Malachi wasn't even. They came after born Lehi until left after Jerusalem. After Lehi left Jerusalem, so right. how was he knowing about Malachi's statements? Well, what do you think? I mean, I know what I think. <laughs> I think. Well, I know Malachi, what you think now. <laughs> I, I, think, I think Malachi is quoting like Zenos or somebody on yeah, the. Yeah, you, you already you already mentioned that about the uh, the what. Did, you call it the, something about first the law first mention law first right? mention okay law right. first mention so okay if so malachi, malachi is quoting them from the brass plates and mm -hmm. then they have the brass plates with them then what malachi is doing you know we always thought that when moroni came and quoted those verses to joseph smith about about this time when it all divides and the choices have to be made and the 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 stubble mm -hmm. is all burned up and the wheat that doesn't go into the garners is this is the time of the wheat harvest the time of the gentiles and and when this all comes down um the wicked are burnt as stubble and the righteous are delivered in zion and we always think that when Moroni is quoting that to Joseph Smith, he's quoting Malachi, but Malachi has to be quoting someone else because <laughs> <laughs> Nephi is quoting yeah. the same prophet. 
that Malachi is quoting. Okay. Does everybody get that? Oh, nice yeah. and clear. That was kind of okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting how that's this, a rabbit trail. Yeah, <laughs> it's interesting how s there's so much parallels uh, type in Revelation. Also, even though yeah. this is talking more about the time of Christ, but it's paralleling things that are happening the in the future in the end. Also, okay. So basically, so go, going back to this, so uh, chapter 26, um, Gentiles will also know Christ and so forth. So, what do you have any any insights there that you'd like to? Uh, talk to us about there in uh, chapter 26 I always have insights but yeah I was going to say I'm waiting, <laughs> Don't ask for I'm that. waiting to wait for him okay. else okay. go for it okay. you're good so how did the Gentiles know Christ um, the scriptures are very very clear that in the end time when the gospel is being taken by kings and queens that are faithful of the Gentiles and, and a lot of the Gentiles are apostatizing as a nation as a whole we turn against the Lord and the gospel has to be taken, but it says my sheep hear my voice. So how do you know who's the 10 tribes? It's simple. Who's my listening? sheep hear my voice. They know the good shepherd. In, in Isaiah 10, the king of Assyria, the bad guy, the left hand in the end time, he's bragging that he's robbed the world and stole the treasures of the world like, like a taking eggs from a nest and not even no one would even dared peep he he gained such power and such control and he's the thief mm -hmm. the end time when it says that the lord comes as a thief jesus isn't a thief it's him it's this bad guy in the end time and when the gospel goes out when, when we say the end time, you're talking about our day, right? Well, our day, because it was it, the, Joseph Smith right. commenced the restoration of the house of Israel. Right. So when it comes to its fulfillment, when the temples are built, when the promised lands are inherited and everything, and this bad guy comes before the end time, and the 144,000 go out to rescue the kings and queens of the Gentiles, my sheep hear my voice. They come. And if you want to hear his voice and, and be familiar with these end time things, you have to study Isaiah. You have to know that it doesn't all, I mean, I know that we like to think that Joseph Smith restored the gospel and then it just gets better and better and better until we all bring in the millennium. That's not the way the prophecies go. We come into a time of apostasy mm -hmm. and judgment and a split between the righteous, the ones that love the words of Christ, mm -hmm. and the ones who say, you know what? They're treating people that believe in Christ pretty rough right now. I think I'll bail. <laughs> now, now, interestingly, that prophecy, I mean, the, if you go back to the, uh, the Book of Mormon in the Book of Mormon, in chapter 8 here, it just, it just reminds me of this uh, particular portion here, but basically, <laughs> this is, uh, says, uh, right, this is page 448, Okay. Go there. and the Annotated Book of Mormon, so page 448, um, and this is, the, this is the part where we have, essentially, it's, it's Moroni, but this is, it's actually in Mormon, right. but this is him talking about, so a little, yeah. little, little, con little confusing there, but he says, uh, behold, Look ye unto the revelations of God, for behold, the time cometh at that day when all these things must be fulfilled. Behold, the Lord hath shown unto me great and marvelous things concerning that which must shortly come at that day when these things shall come forth among you. Behold, I speak unto you as if you were present, and yet you're not. But behold, Jesus Christ has shown you unto me, and I know your doing. And now he tells us what Christ showed him. And so this process that you were just talking about, he was shown this. And so here we have not just Nephi, but we also see Moroni here in the Book of Mormon, in the Book of Mormon, saying basically, I know that you walk in the pride of your hearts. And they talk about the, you know, the, the wearing of fine apparel and envy and strife and malice and persecutions and so forth. And your churches, yea, every, even every one has become polluted. Yes. Now, wait a minute. Every one? Every one. All the churches. All the fruit in the vineyard. Okay, but, but not ours, of course. No. Except for our church. Except for ours. Yeah. 
Uh, um, and all of us think that. Except yes, ours. except we, we think that, but then we have to get down we're here. We're fine. Sam. It says, uh, yeah, yeah, for, yeah we're exactly. Sam, okay. Not, I mean, it says, for yeah. behold, you love your money and your substance and your fine apparel and adorning of your churches, and you love the poor and the and more than you love the poor and the needy and the sick and the afflicted. But this is the one that really threw me for a loop here, and I've and I've and I've, and I've shown this to a number of people here. Because here we have, again, this is Moroni basically saying that Christ showed him our day, and he's telling us what Christ showed him, and he says this in verse 38. Right. O oh, ye pollutions, ye hypocrites, ye teachers who sell yourselves for that which will canker, why have ye polluted the holy church of God? So in the first verses, he's talking about these other, all the, all the churches, yea, every one has become basically apostate, right? And now he's coming but, in the razor but, sharp on but, us. Yeah, but who is this holy church of God? I mean, that's got to be us, right? I mean, this is the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah, he, we are the holy church one, of God. You know, it's talking about God's people that are in apostasy. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's us. And, well, so, and, he, and he says that, the, I mean, he didn't say you guys might become polluted. He says... What I, what I was shown, you're polluted. Yeah. But who did the polluting? This is the, this is the important thing I, that I think is, is so critical. It wasn't the brethren. He tells us who does the polluting in the church. He says, ye pollution, ye hypocrites, ye teachers who sell yourselves for that which will canker. What, what are things that canker? Things that don't last. Right. Things that don't last basically go against the, the definition of truth, Bad which fruit. truth is past, present, and future. It has to be the same, right? It has, right. has to be true throughout time. So things that are going to canker are things that aren't going to last. And he says it's the teachers who sell themselves. So if they sell themselves, that means they're getting paid to do it, right? Yep. So, so my, my question has been, who are these teachers that are selling themselves or being paid to teach things that aren't going to last? And he says, and, uh, and, and, and that, th these particular teachers are the ones who have polluted the Holy Church of God. I love the, 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 next, the next statement. He says, why are ye ashamed to take upon you the name of Christ? And what did what Pre President Nelson do probably just about a year or so ago? He said, we need to stop with this using the term Mormons and Latter-day Saints and so forth and say we are members of the Church of Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Of I mean, think about, you know, obviously Moroni probably saw our day and he probably saw President Nelson. I would guess, and here he, and he says, "Why are ye ashamed to take upon you the name of Christ?" Well, President Nelson isn't the one that's ashamed of doing that because he's the one that's saying that we need to be doing this. So this isn't this 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 polluting is not coming from the brethren; it's coming from other teachers who are being paid to to teach things that are not not going to hold up over time. And uh, so I'll, I'll just let people kind of speculate about I, I who those teachers are, but I don't think that the gospel doctrine teachers around the church. There are some teachers who are teaching stuff that are going to lead to this apostasy, and it's not going to be just people outside of the church. It's going to be people in the church, too. Well, and we have to realize that things heat up politically, yes. socially, economically. It's, it's not going to be easy street to just, you know. Yeah. Well, we're going to have to have a, a humble spirit to see through it. Absolutely. In order and to the spirit of prophecy. And, and, I, and I really think that the Lord and his prophet, the reason why we went from a three-hour block to a two-hour block, and why the emphasis is becoming more and more on our own personal study, yes. is because God is going to need a people who doesn't rely on other people in the church as much, but actually have that relationship with him. We have to see that tree of life. And that follow the prophet you know, to a T, okay, but bottom line is is that uh, we have to have that relationship with Christ if we're going to make it through the things that are coming up. And I think that God is trying to prepare people who are going to be willing to do that, to follow, follow the, the Lord. Follow the commandments of the That's prophets. Right. And I'm jumping right, right ahead of you in the same chapter you were in, mm -hmm. and I just want to go over to verse 23. Search the prophecies of Isaiah. <laughs> Behold, I cannot write them. And then he says, as the Lord liveth. I mean, there's no stronger yeah. oath than that. Yeah. As the Lord liveth, he will remember the covenant that he hath made with yeah. the house of Israel. And then Moroni prays that the Gentiles will have charity for the house of Israel. <laughs> I mean, this is, 
This is right back to Isaiah 49, and this is right there to everything that Nephi is pleading with the Gentiles. Repent. Well, it's, mm-hmm. Focus on it causes the Lord. me to think of Joseph of old when his brothers come. Yeah. And he has that color, many colors, and he shares his love after he feels like. Oh yeah. What I'm saying is, it becomes one family again when Joseph draws him back in. And and just to say that it's not going to be easy in that story. Yeah. It tells, it shows a picture in, in Joseph's patriarchal blessing. It says he is one with the drawn bow. And in Hebrew, the, the, he's got yeah, the bow that. drawn, but he's not letting go. Meaning he and has the words, power to take a v- revenge on his He has the power brothers. to get revenge and everything else. But he it doesn't, doesn't do it. He but doesn't, he doesn't do it. Do it. And holds. then this is what it says. It says in that blessing, it says that, that his arm is quivering. <laughs> He's, t- you know, it's 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 easier it's, it's been to let go, go <laughs> than to hold it uh, and not uh, let go and do whatever it takes. And it, it in in the Hebrew, the Lord actually strengthens His arm so that He cannot. So He can let share go. the take the revenge. Take the revenge. Yeah. yeah. So Which is interesting happen. because that just just in these in these just in the next next week in the next chapter, basically it talks about how. Uh, this is the very end of Nephi's writings, and then this yes. is Second uh, Nephi chapter 33, and he says, uh, verse 7, he says, I have charity for my people. Then verse 8, he says, I have charity for the Jew. And verse 9, I have charity for the Gentiles. This is page 98 of the Annotated okay. Book of Mormon. Yeah, so this is kind of like an Enos experience, basically. Here's yeah. Nephi saying, there's nobody that I don't love. I love everyone. And we, when we get to the point where we become like Christ, and God, God does not. I mean, He loves the He loves the sinners, and He loves the every, He loves every. They're all His children. He doesn't take revenge, and He doesn't take Instead revenge against them, them. <laughs> even, even no matter even though they have crucified His own Son. Yeah. yeah. And that's one of the big differences between the God's true gospel <laughs> yeah. and other religions, who basically an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. If you do this to me, we're gonna we're gonna exact revenge. And how many civilizations have been affected by those kinds of of uh, false understandings? Gods. Well, in, in the Quran, they actually say that it that you one man can't suffer or pay for the sins of another man. It's actually against right what their teaching belief. Is. Yeah, yeah their exactly. Belief. Which is one of the big differences, I mean, as far as that's concerned with what we're, we're talking about there. So, okay, so then in, in, in 2 Nephi chapter 27, this is comparing Isaiah 29. Yes. Okay, um, any insights that you would like to... Nephi does a great job. <laughs> he does a great job, and especially clear in the annotated version, because you can see when Nephi's making a commentary on Isaiah. Yeah, but he, uh, you know, uh, it's one of the things I love about this yeah, edition. I know, right? <laughs> and. And so he is just doing the prophecies of the coming forth of the sealed, uh, of the Book of Mormon, which is part one. We still have part two. Well, I, I would like to jump in. into that right oh, there yeah, in go. verse eight. Go. Yeah, go ahead. Verse eight. And this is verse uh, eight and Second Nephi verse, chapter 27, verse yeah, eight. Yeah, verse eight. Wherefore, because of the things which are sealed up and the things which are sealed shall not be delivered in the day of wickedness and abomination of the people. Wherefore, the book shall be kept from them during our apostasy. So what yeah, that's the what that's thing. saying is the portion of the Book of Mormon that is sealed is not going to come forth in the time of the wickedness and the abomination. Now you I don't know about, I don't know about you, but I always grew up thinking that this is going to come forth sometime in, in our time frame. Sometime yeah. before, but what he's almost telling us there and we actually have an interview of Orson Pratt and Joseph F. Smith interviewing David Whitmer. Mm-hmm. Where he actually says that it doesn't come forth until after the tribulation. The tribulation. That that leads us to understand that that many of the things we used to think are premillennial are actually postmillennial. Or post after the millennium. The after it starts. Yeah. If you read in section seventy seven, yeah. you understand that he says that during the beginning of the seven thousand years is when Christ brings about all these good things. This doesn't just start at the beginning. Mm-hmm. It's not just magically, here I come, everything's in order. The judgments come. Yeah. It's judgments. actually a progression of events as it comes through, kind of like in creation in the Pearl of Great Price. But anyway, so the point I'm trying to make here is that, yeah. that these things start to take place 
after the seventh seal opened. If you look in the book of Revelation, the seventh seal opens, and there's a whole lot of trouble after that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? And it's not right. until after the last week of Daniel 9 that the Christ comes. And the hour of judgment comes down that yeah. Christ comes and sets foot on the Mount of Olives. Yeah, a lot, a lot of people have this, so, this kind of a false idea, or this, this wrong idea, I guess, that during the millennium, everything's just going to be happy, happy, happy. Everybody's going to obey. Understand. Everything's going to be great, and everything's going to be rosy. But actually, I mean, it, it talks about in the scriptures that you know, the right. prophets are going to have to have uh, you know, famines and so forth so they can he humble the people <laughs> again. And right. you know, there's going to be these problems and so forth to keep the people kind of humbled. Well, so, essence, so, there, so people are still going to be people even during the millennium. Yeah. yeah. But there are going to be some significant changes. Even Daniel's vision of the of the statue of Nebuchadnezzar in the whole yeah, scenario. Yeah. When Joseph Smith described this the stone that's cut forth without hands that comes forth, he mm -hmm. defined it as kind of a grinding away of the nations. Meaning it's not just going to be instantaneous. It's not going to just go boom. Boom. Yeah, the yeah. statue's yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, going to be a transition described more like a dawning of the morning. You know, where you, you see the beginning of the light and the the, a little the, bit more, a little, little bit more, more, yeah, more and then it, yeah. com it comes forth in glory when yeah. he comes in glory. But in essence, what I'm saying is the beginning of the millennium isn't defined the way we always thought it was. It starts with probably the worst tribulation week yeah. of years, yes. a Shavua, that we've ever seen. It's virtually the whole book, first part of the book of Revelation is all of this defining times which we got two pictures going on mm -hmm. you got the saints picture going on in dnc 88 and you have the book of revelation judgments going on in 8 9 and 10 of revelation and 11 mm -hmm. you have these two scenarios almost happening playing out the yeah. right and yeah. all of this is designed to clearly give everyone the choice to decide and and the lord pick doesn't aside. yep yeah, pick aside the lord doesn't come until absolutely everyone's had the chance to repent. There's been enough problems, there's been enough judgment that those that aren't gonna repent, aren't gonna repent. And it's kind of like in, um, in the Book of Mormon where you have Amulek and Alma and they're doing, they're, they're burning the women and the children mm -hmm. in the books and, mm -hmm. and, and Amulek tells Alma, why don't we just stop this? Stop this, yeah. raise your hand, use your priesthood. And they say, you know, no, no yes. this has to happen. These people are being them. received into the celestial kingdom, into the arms of Jesus Christ <laughs> as we speak. Yeah. But the rest of the people have to have the cup of iniquity full so that the judgment is just mm -hmm. and it can be finished. And so that's kind which of is, the which grand also, finale. Which kind of brings me into another little, little commentary, and that is that... Um, yeah, I, I talk to so many you know, members of the church, and they go, well, you know, it's going to get really bad for everybody else. <laughs> yeah, I love that, yeah. <laughs> but we're going to be okay right. because we're, you know, the, 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 we're, the, we're the members of the church here. I mean, you know, we're yeah, going to be all right. And, yeah. I, I, and I tell them, you know, that's really not what the scriptures say. We, we had better be prepared as a people, but also prepared individually. Yes. Our, own, our own right. hearts and so forth, so that no matter what happens, you are 100% solid with God. Because what's the worst thing that can happen to you? They can kill you. Right. Yep. And if they kill you, hallelujah, game over. <laughs> exactly. The fifth just, just like you were talking the about with the, with the women and children who were being burned with yes. Elman and, Elm and Amulek. Yeah, you just need to send those people to Daniel 12 and have them read the whole chapter of Daniel yeah. 12. So when, when it says I, even, <laughs> from my house it will go forth. I mean, he's saying, it's going to get bad in my house. When I look at the prophets, like Isaiah <laughs> and Abinadi, they weren't in it. Yeah. To not die. They were in it to save to save souls. at whatever cost. Yeah. So Jesus says, if you love your life and you don't want to die, that's going to lose your eternal salvation. But if you love your brother and you are willing to do whatever the Lord asks needs you. to happen, yeah. then you'll gain eternal life. But none of us are getting out of this life trade. anyway. That's, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's, right. <laughs> that's right. So we might as well. Death we and have, taxes. <laughs> if we're called to serve and bear our testimonies, we should stand and bear our testimonies. Yeah. 
You know, it's it's a beautiful honor. I mean, in reality, it is. Not that I'm sitting there signing up. Okay, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I have that murmuring spirit from time to time when things are uncomfortable. But but I am saying that we are we are at a most glorious time where stories. You know, if you look about it and you think about all your favorite movies you've ever watched, you know. Uh, they all come to the same point of a climax of the story where the hero or the heroes, mm-hmm. they have to make this stand and they don't know whether they're going to win or lose. Yeah. But they stand for truth and that's where we're going to have to come to. Now, we're in the same boat. It's like Daniel said before he went into the lion's den. Yeah. I know not whether God's going to save me. I know he can. But it'll be a first story. I, you know, I, I know if, if he wants to, he can. Yeah. But, but he maybe this know. is my time. Yeah, he didn't know, but he was willing. Yeah. And in his instance, he had a mission to perform. Yeah. He had a big mission to perform, and many of us will. You know, many of us will be spared through these times. Absolutely. And, and then there'll be Absolutely. wonderful things. In fact, I guarantee that every single one will be spared that God needs to have spared. <laughs> That's exactly. <laughs> exactly. And a lot of people are going to die because not, number, they might die because, number one, they maybe they fall, fall away. But, but I think that a lot of it's going to be they, they may die because to. they need to be a witness. Yes. Absolutely. Against yeah. those who have done you know, the iniquity or the, the, the wrong yeah. of, of that. You know, and um, and if you di- and whenever you die, basically it's one of the things I learned from the with, from our son passing away, is that you know what, he lived exactly as long as he was supposed to live. Yeah. This is what he signed up for in the preexistence, and this is what he this is as long as he did. So, so that's one of the little things that uh, you know. So so never worry about when you're going to to uh, do it. You will live exactly as long as the Lord the needs you to to live. I, I love the statement that we've heard some of our mentors along the way say that the safest place to be is about God's business. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, we should be about his business and then we're going to be right. where we need to be when we need to be. There. And everything will happen. God will make it happen. And, and I yeah. actually pray, you know, if, if there's any kids out there or anything that think this is all scary and everything, I pray God make me brave because I'm the biggest chicken of everybody. <laughs> I really am. I can think of a lot of awful ways to go. But I'm just like, God... Make me brave, like Joan of Arc. <laughs> I have Make a, me brave. I have a favorite time. movie yeah. that I always r- relate to in that regard, and that's The Old King and I. Make believe you're brave, and the trip will <laughs> yeah, take you exactly. far. <laughs> you may be as brave as you make believe you are. Right. <laughs> that's a, we have a bare toy voice there. <laughs> anyway, it's kind of that whole concept of, yeah. of just, you know, faith. Go into this with faith. Yes. Go into it with the faith that, that don't worry. I yeah. mean, you know, about about that. Basically, you know, if I've learned do what's any, right. If I've learned anything in all the DVDs and the study of numbers and the studies of of the way God pulls off His plan in perfection, when I've gone through the numbers of Daniel and the prophecies, and I've seen how dead on He fulfills these prophecies. Yeah. If I've learned anything, it's that God has this. Yeah. <laughs> He's got this. Yeah. Trust in God, and everything else will work out. He has it in, in a degree of perfection that we can't even imagine. Yeah. How yeah. perfect it is. All right, we got to finish up this. Get to uh, the little end bit of the here, story so. right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was, I mean, that was that was awesome though. Um, one of the things I wanted to bring up was the in in the uh, on page ninety two. This is Second Nephi chapter twenty seven, and this is verse sixteen. Uh, there's a little bit of a prophecy here about uh, what was going to be happening here. Take these words, which are not, this is from uh, verse 15. But behold, it shall come to pass that the Lord God shall say unto him to whom he shall deliver the book. Take these words, which were not sealed, and deliver them to another, that, that he may show them unto the learned. Saying, Read this, I pray thee. And the, and the learned shall say, Bring hither the book, and I will read them. And now, because of the glory of the world, and to get gain, will they say this and not for the glory of God. And the man shall say, I cannot bring the book, for it is sealed. Then shall the learned say, I cannot read it. That's Isaiah chapter 29. Okay, right. okay. but basically, so we also know that uh, about the uh, the story here with, um, with uh, the Anthem transcript and yeah. so forth. And if you'd like to learn more about that with Martin Harris and what happened with that uh, on page 91, 
oh, is an insight page. It's so cool when they line up the Algonquin alphabet <laughs> with the Egyptian the characters, Nephites, yeah. and you're just like, oh my goodness, it's the same <laughs> alphabet. Yeah, that's pretty pretty interesting. Martin Harris basically um, having taken it to Charles Anthon and so forth, and and uh, just fascinating. That you know, it's one of the few things that we have that shows the actual characters um, from the gold plates. Right. And so that's it. That's it. That, that, that there's more information about that, but you can go there. Great commentary and application mm -hmm. by Nephi of Isaiah chapter 29 to his people, to their voice coming from the dust, the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. And just remember when you read that, that that's not all finished. We don't have the rest of the Book of Mormon yet. Mm -hmm. There's more mm -hmm. to come right there in that chapter. So um, Isaiah's future. <laughs> You bet. All right, so let's see here. Um, okay, chapter 28, Second Nephi. Was there anything else that you wanted to talk about in chapter 27? I, I think we, uh, okay, we kind of covered the... Uh, yeah, I want to get to chapter 30. Okay, let's just, let's, let's just <laughs> go right over there. The, um, the, the only other thing is that I want to, I want to point out here, in, well, actually from verse 15, really, but we don't, I can probably read the whole thing, but he says, well, yeah, well, let's, let's start from there. So verse 15, he says, Oh, the wise and the learned and the rich that are puffed up in the pride of their hearts and all those who preach false doctrines and all those who commit whoredoms and pervert the right way of the Lord, woe, woe, woe be unto them. So get three woes. Okay, right, here. so you know what that means in Hebrew, right? So like in mm -hmm. English we do big, bigger, bigger, biggest, biggest, but they don't have those superlative categories in Hebrew. It's woe, oh. woe, whoa. And then, whoa! whoa! <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's like an exclamation point there. Okay, go okay. ahead. All right, God Almighty, he says, For they shall be thrust down to hell. Woe unto them that turn aside for the just for a thing of naught, and revile against that which is good, or meanness, and say that it is of no worth. For the day shall come that the Lord God will speedily visit the inhabitants of the earth, and in that day that they are fully ripe in iniquity, they shall perish. But behold, if the inhabitants of the earth shall repent, of their wickedness and abominations, they shall not be destroyed, saith the Lord That's of hosts. That's the division that we were talking about there. Yeah. Yep. But behold, the great and the abominable church, the whore of all the earth, must tumble to the earth, and great must be the fall thereof. So this great and abominable church, basically that's the, that's the great and spacious building uh, of, of, of um, Lehi's dream. And he saw that great and spacious building existed out in the past, also in their day, and also in the future, and each one of those kind of represents some different things in those different time frames. Right. Uh, but he says it's going to fall because it has no foundation. It was standing, right. as it were, in the air. Right. So all these people, all these thousands and thousands of people, are, you know, multitudes without number, basically, and the great and spacious building, they all thought they were in this really great edifice. It was solid as a rock, and they, that's why they could stand and, and mock those who had taken out the fruit, right? And but they didn't realize that they were in a building that has no foundation. Right, and, and why did they not know that? Because of the mists of, mists of darkness. Mm -hmm. So it's a fun question to ask your kids, like if you're, you're going to do the come follow me with younger kids, you say, what does God not, what does the devil not want you to see? What is the mists of darkness blocking? Trying to hide. Yeah. It's blocking the tree of life. Yeah. It's blocking the fact the that that building, building has no foundation. Yeah. And it's he doesn't want you to see the river of filth. That's <laughs> why there's the mist there, because the devil is going to lead you down to hell. Carefully. Yeah. Carefully. Carefully. And blind. With a flax and cord. And blind. <laughs> yes. By the way, flax is interesting because uh, flax... Comes, anyway, we, won't go into that. <laughs> right, we have a whole other podcast about that. We have come up with Kay Fairchild. It's awesome about flax and where it's found and what the... Anyway, it's pretty, pretty cool. But just the last couple of things here. So he says, uh, um, verse 19, for the, devil, for the kingdom of the devil must shake, and they which belong to it must needs be stirred up into repentance, or the devil will grasp them with his everlasting chains, and they will be stirred up to anger and perish. For behold, at that day shall the rage in the hearts... that at, at that day shall he rage in the hearts of the children of men and stir them up to anger against that which is good. And others will he pacify and lull them away into carnal security. And they will say, this is a, this is a fairly um, well-known one, common thing, all is well in Zion. 
Yea, Zion prospereth. It's about them All and those well. sectarians in Joseph Smith's day. And, and this isn't us. This isn't us. <laughs> well, why, why is Zion well? Because it prospereth. Right. Wow, isn't that interesting that we are in one of the most prosperous times in the history of the United States right now? Right. Seven um, years of plenty. Seven years of plenty That's and so forth. That's why we're going to need a ball and a bow <laughs> <laughs> and some guidance to uh, make it through. Yeah. Yeah. So you're going to need to have a ball, which is going to give you direction. You need to have a bow, which is going to give you dependence on the, the Lord to provide on the Lord for you. To provide. Okay. Not our own. Prosperity. What are some of the other things you wanted to? Well, and I think that you know, with the boat. To you get out, even know how what to do to leave so, the area. You know, I, I, I that's one of the things that I love in Revelation 12 is it, it doesn't say that the woman or the the people of God, it doesn't say that she escapes to the bunker with all the food storage. No, <laughs> it says that she uh -huh. escaped to a place that God had prepared for. Her. So yeah. the wandering in the wilderness, that journey, is a learning. To trust God. Well, isn't isn't is. that the question that's proposed throughout all Scripture? Is how, yeah. Do you trust me? Yeah. Isn't you that what God me, has God. been asking us throughout our whole earthly experience? Isn't that what He's asking each and every one of our hearts? No matter yeah. what happens. No matter what happens. Isn't that what, the reason why we do the experiment of the Word and right. we plant the seed and so forth, and we see it, and then we learn, and we grow, and we gain yes. knowledge, and that knowledge gives us strength and power right. you know it's like, it's like I've, I've said n numerous times in, in, in to audiences all over the the world really you know which is which is greater faith or knowledge and most people who are members of the church will say well faith is greater than knowledge until I read until I help them remember that basically Joseph Smith went into that grove of trees with a lot of faith but when he walked out of that grove, grove <laughs> yeah. of trees he no longer had faith that there was right. a God <laughs> He knew him. Yeah, I knew it, yeah. and I knew God knew it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I love that statement. That's my favorite statement of Joseph Smith. I knew it, I knew that God knew it, and I could not deny it. He didn't say I had faith in it, did he? Right. Yeah, at this he point. He knew it. That was knowledge, and that, and that knowledge is really what, what we want to gain. When we gain that knowledge, then we gain that trust. And, and you're going it's kind And of we can trust God yes. implicitly and absolutely, even, even if it comes down to like, like, like Isaac had to trust Abraham. Yeah. As he was binding him and preparing him as a sacrifice. This wasn't his first go around. He'd obviously offered sacrifice with Abraham before his dad. And so he knew what was coming up. He had to be and he willing. He submitted himself yeah. just like the Christ submitted himself, himself yeah. to his father. And it was never beautiful. It was never required. Yeah. Well, he had to be willing. Back in that yeah. back in that same concept that you talk about Joseph coming out of the grove and having knowledge. Mm -hmm. You know, Joseph Smith taught that the Spirit of God is pure intelligence. Mm -hmm. So, in in essence, faith is the means to get to knowledge. But yes. pure knowledge, he always would say, you know, the, the place you can learn the most is five minutes <laughs> yeah. on a mountaintop with God. You know, yeah. Yeah. you know. So that's it, it's the pure knowledge that leads us through this. In fact, in Daniel, we talk about out. How in our day, in fact, we're about to get to that, I think. This is where she kind of wanted to go in 30. Yes. She's, she wants to go there. Right but there, in the essence, <laughs> in Bible 9, it says, we live in a day where knowledge will be increased. We have this. Now, both good. Yeah, but we also live in a day when there will be lots and lots of information out there, but people won't even know where to go. They can't find the truth because they don't even know where to go look for it because that's, there's so much knowledge that's actually just overrun everything. Yeah, it's actually been studies made that too many choices sometimes confuse us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's really true. We have to kind of learn to discipline our mind yeah. and keep our focus into the things that we need to know and want to know yes. instead of just. You know, surfing you. Miscellaneous YouTube. stuff, yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> we yeah. have to we have to raise her in and and go yeah. for the goal. Yep. Yep. Okay, so let's go ahead. So basically that that was the thing it says after he says, All is well in Zion, the Zion prospereth all is well, and thus the devil cheateth their souls and leadeth them away carefully down to hell. And that's one of the th one of the things that I think that just hit, you know this is many years ago when I was reading that and just the, the word carefully, carefully, you know I mean this is this is not something that's just helter skelter, 
he has been pl plotting and planning and, 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 and ranging everything for this moment when he can basically lead these people, Zion, down to hell. So what kind of things do we have in our culture and so forth today that are that are basically things that they look good and it seems like it would be good and so forth, but it's just, like, just another step in that carefully leading them down to... Auburn would say it's all right. Destructions. I, I'm going to take it right back to the tree of life. If you take all the descriptions of the fruit mm -hmm. in, in from Lehi, from Nephi, from everywhere, it always talks about the most beautiful thing exquisite. ever. The exquisite. Exquisite. Whiteness above any other. Yeah. There's nothing better than this fruit. And yet and some people. And I think that the reason that the prophets are describing that fruit that way, because if there is anything that we think is better than, than that, that fruit, we'll leave. We'll mm. join those. There is nothing. That big building over there. Yeah. There, there is nothing <laughs> yeah. as precious, as glorious, as white, as beautiful, as exquisite as the love of God. And well, Satan wants us to believe that the, there are better things. That's the need yeah. for the mist of darkness. Yeah. So that we can't us, see yeah. it. The idea is so that we can't see it. And blinded. We're blinded. By the craft of men and so right. forth and, and so on. And lead us yeah. carefully down to hell. Yep. All right. They call them awful chains. Okay. So let's keep. Uh, so so I know you wanted to really jump in here too. Uh, so let's go ahead and. Um, Rhonda, take it away. Okay. So <laughs> number one, I just wanted to say that you know we're talking about knowing the Lord, and, and what it really is like when Joseph Smith knew the Lord. And then I love this verse. This is you know Nephi is going to just take us right into the millennium here, and he's going to. So where are you at? I'm in thir uh, 2 Nephi 30, verse 15, okay. and it says, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. He's there. He's really there. The second coming of Jesus Christ is not some far future event. He's really coming again and we'll be able it says and all of your children will know the Lord I mean let's go wow. up to the temple and mm -hmm. and visit with Jesus today yeah. I, I, that, that's incredible to me but the uh, the other thing I wanted to bring out be, before we close is this imagery that um, that Isaiah is using in Isaiah 11 that Nephi is quoting here and he talks about pairs of animals and we we often imagine the millennium and we imagine um, a lion and a lamb laying down together and the reality is that's not in scripture what we the reason we've come up with that image is because Jesus Christ came as a lamb the first time and then scripture says he's as the lion the second, the, the second coming and so we put the lion in the lamb but in reality it's, it's pretty fascinating the pairs of animals that Isaiah uses so if you look it first says that there's a wolf and a lamb that's that, in verse 12 right but by verse the way that's 12? on page 95 in the annotated book of Mormon um, on the on the right hand side thank you and there's a wolf and a lamb and then it says there's a leopard mm -hmm. and a kid. Now, now I be thinking about what's the common denominator between all these pairs of animals. Yeah. Okay, so you got these pairs. So you got the wolf and the lamb. Okay, and you got and the, the leopard, leopard and the kid. And the little goat, the, yep. the kid. The little kid. And then kid. we have a lion and a calf. Okay. Okay, and I, I'm getting a little worried here for the lamb and the goat and the and the calf here. <laughs> okay, and then we have a bear and a cow. Because okay. some of these are, one, one of them are predators. <laughs> exactly. And the other ones are the ones that get preyed upon. <laughs> right. And so in the scriptures, in the law of Moses, these were clean animals. A clean animal was a submissive animal, an animal that could be offered in the temple. Uh -huh. A clean animal. And an unclean animal, the reason 
it, it it wasn't in the temple as an offering was because it was a predator. <laughs> it, it would not go willingly to the altar, okay? And so these are the unclean animals that we see. Um, even in, in chapter 1 of Isaiah, there's a donkey, you know, and, and it says that the ox doesn't know his master yeah. and that the ass or the donkey doesn't know its stall. And what you're going to find is throughout Isaiah, the clean animals represent the house of Israel. Okay. And the unclean animals represent the Gentiles. And so, in the end time, we have Gentiles, just in case we, that we were still choking on being Gentile. Okay? Uh, we I'll have become Gentiles <laughs> that submit. The best they, of leopards. They <laughs> love the Lord. They hear His voice. And you have wolves and lambs lying down together they're they're not different anymore so so why, so why do you think that he i mean he could have had just enough to say that you know the bear and the and the ox right right but instead he gives the wolf and the lamb and a leopard and a kid and a calf and a lion and a cow and a bear and, and we intensify all the way up to a child the most perfect of god's creation oh so you're saying that these are these are in in a kind of an order yes and they're so from so yeah so the wolf is probably not quite as vicious or ferocious maybe as a leopard right and a leopard is maybe not quite as bad as a lion a lion's bigger it's a little more hard powerful to predator see because we're not so super familiar with those predators but this yeah. in in the hebrew this would have been uh, you know measuring yeah. the danger and then and then a bear of course is the is the top dog of all yeah, predators don't mess with the bear. on the earth today so yeah so that's the biggest one and then you have and that's snake. paired with a bigger one which is a cow yeah and then you have a snake and a child the most precious of god's creation yeah. and one of the lowest of, of the, the, the yeah. and even during the millennium they are not harming each other and so this is a time of not just peace but when everyone is so the house of israel and, and the, the gentiles joseph are going to get along is that the idea all become one yeah. and look at that it's saying there in second nephi 30 and 29 that the word becomes one the nations become one, and it means they all are becoming saints of God. And this is all during? During the millennial reign. Time. Okay. After all the of the trials, after all of this, then they become united as God's people, and Jesus Christ is not just king. Mm -hmm. All of us will know him. I mean, you couldn't end with a more beautiful promise than that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I just and and there's so many keys in in Isaiah. So um, I so just tell us really sure, quickly yeah. how 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 can we learn more about this? And let, let me just kind of tell you a couple few things here. First off, you have been a regular speaker at our our. our um, events, our expos and conferences and so forth, and uh, we want to appreciate that. Um, we we've that. recorded a lot of those different things, and uh, and so if you go to the uh, our streaming video site, Book right. of Mormon Evidence mm -hmm. Streaming, that's Book of Mormon Evidence Streaming. Right. Um, if you're a, if you're a, if you have a subscription, basically it's like seven ninety seven a month or something. Right. If you get a year long subscription, then you can you can watch. Um, your other presentations, I mean, and some of these have just been fantastic. Oh, I mean, star the ones, star ones are just and then, yeah. out of this world. <laughs> 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 just kidding, kidding me. Anyway, but seriously, they are they're awesome. And anyway, so, um, but yeah, but you know, but coming, to, you know, just a, an understanding of the of of where the planets and alignments and so forth happen, and in, in, in very interesting points in our history, it's shows that clock. nothing, nothing was ever random. No about this whole, our whole galaxy. Well, wouldn't you? And, it, and clearly probably not the whole universe, but at least in our, in our solar system at least, and in our galaxy, things are astounding how things always line up to specific dates and, and, and so forth. It's all a beautifully orchestrated. And it's not anything to do yeah. with astrology. That's Satan book. hijacking the stars. Yeah. The God spun the clock of the stars from Satan always hijacks God's stuff. He does. He does. Temple symbols, all of it. Everything. Anything that is yeah. true and good, he's going to hijack it. Yeah, I mean the rainbow, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, so, whatever. So things. in essence, just to clarify what you just went through, 
if you look at the way the appointments of the Hebrew calendar run in conjunction with the, the heavens, and you tie it together into a nice pretty bow, you have God's appointments with the earth. Yes. Mm-hmm. When yeah. Christ is going to come and, and fulfill his yeah. scheduled appointments, he laid it out in perfection. And we can know that thing, but it's not going to just fall on you. You have to basically put in the time and effort and, and, uh, and, and learn these signs and so forth to the point where you can actually start to see. He said, he said that, that, that you know, for everybody else, it's going to come like a thief in the night. Right, but for, but for those who are seeking to understand and learn these signs that God has already set up from the very beginning of this earth, this won't be like a thief in the night. And, that, and this exactly. is where I think we can get a lot of, of comfort uh, because we don't have to be going into this blind. Going into what blind is what Satan wants. That's the mist of darkness. That's, he doesn't want you to see what's going on. And so we have to understand who we are. We have to understand these prophecies. And when we go into it, um, yeah, we, won't, we may not know everything that's going to happen, but we, we know that God will take care of it no matter what happens. And we know enough to know the seasons and the, the layout and, and, and the to time. prepare and, and, so and yeah. but like you said earlier the the most important thing is the preparing of the heart because in all of these things as we come to this point in our in our lives that we're i mean how many people have been afraid of the end times yeah we've all had those moments but this is the most exciting time yeah in this the is history of earth this is the climax <laughs> of the story that we will you know we're about to we're about to see a uh, terrible reference, but it's the best I can come up with on the <laughs> We're about to see Frodo throw the ring in the in Mount Morador and the end of Sauron. <laughs> it's gonna be, you know. um, but anyway, we're, we're in a situation where, where this, is, this is the great scene at the end when Christ comes and, he, scene, and yeah. he comes and he steps on the Mount of Olives and and we enter a whole new era. With Christ reigning personally upon the earth. Yep. Yeah, right there in How cool is that? The Articles of Faith. We'll have we'll have Christ we'll have the, the New Jerusalem, the Jerusalem will be the two focal points. We'll have the, the, the word coming from Jerusalem, we'll have the law going forth from the New Jerusalem, and the whole world will basically be in, in, in one accord, I guess, is what yes. you want to say. Right. That the animals all laying down together again, and the patterns are all here. Yeah. And so, all so you think these are nice. these are these are figurative animals, though? These are not necessarily the animals' animals. Well, or do you, you think know, they're in the, Hebrew, yeah, it's usually both. The symbolic level never discounts the plain the, and simple level. The, the physical level. So it's both. Cool. It's both. Okay. So, um, we're teaching Isaiah classes this yes. year. Yes. Tell us about that. So we're going to be putting up the classes. We're going to do 30 classes. Uh, how are they available? And they will be available on the site, the Firm Foundation we're, site. We're hoping to make them available to you and yeah. also on our awesome. site. Awesome. And, and um, then um, there's a study guide. This is a, a six. Oh, this, look at that thing. This is Thumb my book. <laughs> After 25 years, it's, <laughs> it's being published now and you can get it. Um, this is the works of Abraham Giliati um, that are designed for teenagers so we have the new translation of isaiah and then we have the commentary of avraham Gilyadi that he did at byu the 33 hour lecture we transcribed it all put it in verse by verse so if there's a verse you don't understand you can just go right Pull to right that verse and, and 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 look at the commentary that's there but most importantly it has all of the literary structures those jewish tools that open up the understanding of what's going on they're all marked with poetic symbols chiastic symbols and this is the literary wow. message plus the analytical commentary Plus, because teenagers and, and me <laughs> like props and visuals, there's like a hundred... Presentation. Yes. <laughs> Presentation, there's, that's right. <laughs> there's 120 pages of colored charts that we've put in there to help see the structures that Isaiah wow. is using in there. So this is a study guide that, that can go up. with, um, that thing up here so with can... the lessons that we're going to be teaching on video. We're having so much fun. We've already done the first couple of classes and... It's it's just it's candy shop for me. It's the first time I've got to go through Isaiah verse by verse and and, oh, and just 
and just enjoy every second of it. So. Okay, now I, I know that you guys have also put together some awesome uh, um, DVDs and so forth. So just really quickly, uh, can you just give us a, just a quick little overview of each well, one of Well, I talked a little bit about the Luminical So people can know wall. where to go to find additional information if they want to go more in depth about some of these areas. Um, in essence, these DVDs go through the time of the Gentiles, the woman at the well experience. The fall feast of the second coming. The Daniel stuff goes through the precision of God's fulfillment of prophecy. So are these in kind of like uh, in different different categories? I mean, Yes, you know, most definitely. Okay, so kind of tell us and, what the categories are and how these fall into them. Well, a lot of them, I go into the, the prophecies of Daniel in such a way to describe the precision that God has fulfilled his word and the precision and the patterns he will fulfill his word. Right, and there's no doubt what Je what year Jesus was crucified. D Daniel just nails it absolutely. Yeah, absolutely there's a lot of people that down. have different ideas. Different ideas, that, but yeah. but the the when you get down to the layers of Daniel and the precision of his prophecy and how it ties to the decrees, and it's pretty well solid. You know, you can pretty well lock it in, and it's gematric. What's that word? Dramatically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sound. Because because if you look at the pattern of God, God is three, and it's three three. Anyway, just interesting side note. <laughs> anyway, anyway, you get into these things and you start to understand some of this stuff. And I go into that a lot of the the prophetic fulfillments of the of the feasts in the past, so that you can see that when we How go into the future. It's going to happen previously. again. You know God's got this. You know God's got this, and it's going to happen again. And and you can actually get to the point where you can actually lay Daniel's patterns onto, Down, onto our day. Onto our day. Onto our day, yeah. And Even the last week of Christ, you can... Yeah, there's layering everywhere. But any, anyway, in, in these things, you get to lay it out. And, in, and then you connect it with the heavens. You connect it with... The restoration of Israel and the signs in the heavens that back that up and everything that's happening. Um, it's hard to describe this all in just a minute or two, but in essence, right. we have these these. Well, where, where can they go to find more information? Then? Our website, website is propheticappointments.com. Right. Propheticappointments.com. Oh. And so, you know. Well, we're excited about this. This is going to be uh, fa fantastic. And uh, wow, this is. This, I, I hope everybody has enjoyed. The, this uh, did you have any thanks, final things you wanted thanks to? Thanks for letting us share. I mean, <laughs> we love oh this is God. just such torture, you know. <laughs> for us to sit and talk about. We can sit here all night. You know? <laughs> 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 we, we just about have. <laughs> all, right, right. all right, listen, everybody. So uh, this this going to be a wrap for uh, for this lesson. We want to thank you so much, uh, Ron and Farrell, for coming and being out here and and uh, and sharing just a, a little teeny portion of of the years and years of sacrifice and study that you've done to be able to uh, to share this so uh, we hope that it's going to be a blessing to all of you uh, we want to invite you again back next week you want to share it with your friends and uh, give us uh, some, some thumbs up on when it comes down to that uh, you can find these podcasts now on pretty much almost any uh, podcasting you know outlet and then also you can go to bookofmormonevidence.org if you want to check that out and uh, there's, there's a, a page there you can pull up all the different things there um, we encourage you to spend some time on the uh, on the Book of Mormon Evidence site. There's uh, there's hundreds of videos and dozens of articles and so forth that that give you a more profound understanding of the Book of Mormon, which is our whole goal of this year is to uh, to give people a, a renewed excitement and experience um, with the Book of Mormon that basically will change lives. Right. And uh, so we hope that this brings you closer to the Lord in in that process. And uh, thank you. See you next week. Thank you for listening to the Book of Mormon Evidence Podcast. If you enjoyed this Come Follow Me supplemental study, click the like button or share it with your friends. Be sure to go to bookofmormonevidence.org or firmfoundationexpo.org where you can buy tickets to the upcoming Firm Foundation Expo held Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, April 9th, 10th, and 11th in Sandy, Utah. There will be three education-packed days, 80 distinguished speakers, 150 presentations and classes on Book of Mormon research, signs of the times, science and religion, self-reliance and health, constitutional studies, and world events.